Stereo's Trigger family of capos offers a buzz-free, in-tune performance for players of all kinds. They allow precise micrometer tension adjustment, ensuring the perfect clamping pressure, dialed into your exact playing preference, so you can set it and forget it. Today I got Tom Bresch with us. So guitar legend, storyteller, wine lord. The wine lord, yes. <laughs> and lover of beef stroganoff yeah. as well. With my Bordeaux wine. Yeah, right, right. So uh, the last time I, I, I saw you, Tom, we were um, doing a Johnny Highland thing, and I had the misfortune of being on right after you and right before Brett Mason. So it was just, it was. It was a, it was nah, terrified. Oh God! And and Tom was I had my beautiful girlfriend at the time there with me, and Tom was chatting her up the whole time, and she was ready to leave with Tom. I'm innocent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are, you are. I could, I, I mean, you're a charming guy. She couldn't help herself. <laughs> hey, let's uh, let's talk about that guitar. This uh, guitar, yeah. This, this is, I call this a super duelette. It's made by Del Langons of Holland, Michigan. Del's now retired, living somewhere in Florida, uh -huh. not making guitars anymore, which is a shame. I've got a number of his guitars. He made my first handmade guitar that was a cutaway nylon string, dolled out. I mean, uh, it, was, it was something, and yeah. it still is. Yeah. And then uh, he saw me on Austin City Limits playing Travis's Martin with the Big Be Next. Sure. And he called me and said, hey, I want to make a, a dreadnought for you because, you know, not a lot of people are into those funky sort of nylon string guitars except the classical guys. Mine had 14 frets to the neck oh. and all that, not 12 like the classical. And it's cut away and all inlaid. So uh, I said, no, I, would, I probably wouldn't play it. I said, I play, if I want to play a steel string acoustic, I play Travis's. And about two months, three months later, a UPS guy comes up with a big box from Dell and it says, play it in good health. And I got the thing out and God, it was gorgeous. It looked like the big brother to the nylon string. And I hated the neck. <laughs> That's what I loved about Langon's guitars, these incredible necks like this. Both of these are, are just perfect to me. Yeah. And I hated that neck, but I used it for about, well, maybe a year and a half or two years. Just played through it. was like it. a baseball bat. Yeah. It's just so big and round. And I play all these chords like, like that well, where you- Your thumb's over all the time. Thumbs all, all of my, uh, very, I won't do a G that way, I'll do it this way. Same, same notes, same, not one thing different. Except it's like this. Now I can move behind the bar, right? Which you can't do if you're playing like this. So I had something go wrong with the pickup system in my nylon string Langon. So I was going to be playing up in Michigan. So I brought the steel string and the Langon, uh, the gut string, up there. And I said to Dell, I said, "Here, can you fix that." He was about 15 minutes. How's that? Perfect. Thanks. Wow. That's all there is to it. Yeah. I said, he says, uh, 
Never said anything about the steel string. I'm surprised you like the neck. Well, Dell, I really hate the neck. <laughs> but I've been playing it, but I don't like it. Well, I made it big and round because I knew you wouldn't like it, but I didn't know what you wanted. I figured first thing you would say, send it back to me, say, I want this taken off, this, 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 this. And I never heard from him. I said, well, I said, well, I've been playing it and cussing it the whole time. <laughs> he says, uh, what do you want? I said, well, it's just too fat and it, there's too much in here and in here. You want a V-neck? No, I don't want a V-neck, but I want it so I can play all these chords. And he lays it down on his bench and puts some stuff on it and takes this big thing and goes, <laughs> and wood's coming off. I, I said, I got to leave while you're doing it. I can't watch that. <laughs> well, it's just wood. He says, I do this all the time. You know, well, I don't go through this all the time. So anyway, he comes about a half an hour later, he comes out and says, come try this guitar. I play, I said, whoa, can you take just a little more off right in through here and right in here just a little bit? Yeah, Tom, okay, Tom, that's what he like. Oh, okay, Tom. And he's doing that again. I went out and played more of his guitars out in the front lobby. Yeah. And uh, he comes out and says, here, Try this out. Oh, and it was, it's still, uh, a lot of people that have played said, that, that's got to be the finest neck on a steel string guitar I've ever felt, ever. Wow. And to me, it is, and and I played it, I can't believe I played it for two years, just, just cussing it and hating <laughs> it. Uh, how can he made that one so perfect and this one just <laughs> totally sucks? Well, then I found out, you know. He didn't want to change anything. So uh, I was playing in France one time, and they had a big guitar show there, and there was this little guitar, it's like a concert-sized guitar, hanging from this wire. It had two necks. And the guy's name was Favino. And he says, yes, this is how I make uh, the steel string guitar. And he turns around, this is how I make the nylon string guitar. I said, can I, can I play that? Yes, you can play. He takes it down. And because it was small, boy, this one neck hit my arm all the time. I thought, ooh, this really stinks. Yeah. But it's an interesting idea. Can I shoot a couple pictures of this? No, you cannot shoot a picture. <laughs> oh, okay. So I always have cameras with me. I'm a camera nut. And I went over to our little booth that they had for the Atkins Dadi guitar festival and I had my camera was on a tripod and I zoomed it all in focused up on that camera hang and I told my girlfriend I said just roll this and stay on the guitar because I'm gonna go over there and look at it and turn it all around and everything so I went and turned it all around and I said is this for sale no it's not for sale you cannot buy oh, okay Come to find out, he thought if he made that, Marcel Dadi would buy it. Marcel says, I am Marcel Dadi. I don't buy guitars. People <laughs> give them to me. I play them. <laughs> Good old Marcel. I miss him. But um, when I got back to the States, I did some frame grabs and sent the, this stuff up there to Del Langons. I said, I want you to make me a guitar like this. Got a guitar on both sides. And he calls me up. He says, what size is it? I said, well, that's small. It's got to be a dreadnought size. It has a guitar on both sides? Yeah, steel string on one side. Just flip it over. Nylon string on the other. Okay, Tom. <laughs> um, it'll be probably a year. I'm so backed up, you know. I said, that's fine. Whenever you get around to it, I, I would love to, to, to have one like that. So maybe two months, maybe three months tops went by. And he calls me up and he says, what kind of pickups you want in this thing? He says, it works. It's incredible. <laughs> so I don't have pickups in it, but everybody's coming by, the paper, shot pictures and all that. So I don't want to, don't let the cat out of the bag. But, <laughs> well, I can't help it. He says, it's just amazing. I says, is your neck, your arm hit the other neck? No, which it doesn't. You can do whatever you want. You don't God. even know this is here. See, it looks awkward, but I, but I guess the way it's designed, it's not at all, huh? It's perfect there. I put it here. Now this is out of the way. This, God. nothing there. And the original one has Tom on one side. On the steel string side, it says Bresh. More people call me Bresh than Tom. Yeah. So it says Bresh here. You turn it over, it says Tom. 
So when he sent it up to me, um, first thing I did was went over to Chet's office. I called Chet and said, hey, hey what are you doing? Well, I'm just uh, hanging around here, don't you know, and uh, <laughs> thinking about going to Arnold's and having some lunch. You want to go? Yeah, but I got something I want you to see. You've never seen anything like it. I've seen everything. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring it over anyway. <laughs> All right, see you in a few. And I went over there. Well, that's the damnest thing I ever saw. You seen a lot like this? Never saw one like that. <laughs> I'll be damned. Can I play it? Yeah. And I gave it to him, and it was funny hearing Chet screw up so much. <laughs> he would be playing something, he'd go, uh, whatever he played, played a little something. Then he would go up and overshoot. Damn, I don't know if I'm supposed to go to the E or the R or where the hell I'm supposed to go. I've never realized that I look at these fret markings. But I must because I don't know where to go. I'm lost. Let me play the nylon string side. He turned it over. He started on something really beautiful. I think it sounds good. Feels real good, too. He was up and he overshot it. What the hell? <laughs> How many damn frets is on there? I said 14. It's like a guitar. It's like an ovation gut string. Nylon string guitars are 12 frets. Not this one. <laughs> and it's got the T, H, O, and the M. I don't know where the hell to go. Let's go have lunch. It's on me. Boy, that thing is great. Play me something on it. And I played a little tune. I'll be down. That's a, a, a attention guitar. A attention getter. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so you. that started Dell and I. And the only case that it had was a... Dell had a big anvil case, the thing weighed 80 pounds. Oh, God. That's the only thing that would hold a two-sided guitar. Sure. Because they don't make two-sided guitar cases. So anyway, for 12 years, I <laughs> carried that thing and put it on planes and argued with people and about, <laughs> we're not taking that, yeah, you got to take it right, you know. And so finally, um, Dell says, oh, uh, I told him, I said, there's a company, I forget what they're called, but the, I said, they're in Michigan about 50 miles above you, that they'll make any kind of case for any kind of guitar, and it only adds five pounds to the weight of the guitar. Oh, okay, Tom, I'll call him. And he called me, thanks, that's a great case. So it's about 10, 12 years later, Dell called me, said he's coming through Nashville. Do I need any maintenance done on my guitars? I said, yeah. And he says, and then I, I brought you a present too. I said, oh, okay. So I went over there. He was staying in a hotel. I, I got over to the hotel and he, I brought that big case in. He says, oh God, you still carrying that case? It's the only case I got. Well, you told me about a place. I said, yeah, but I didn't have a case. Well, you do now. And he said to his wife, go out to my, out to the van out there and bring in that case. That's for Tom. I was going to give that to you as a second case. I said, I don't have a second case. Yeah, well, you do now. You well, you got the first one, and you can have that big one if you need a second case. So then I got that. And I got talking about it. He says, I want to make you another duelette, because he says, you know, that's the very first one ever made. And he says, I, I'm not sure. I said, well, it's, it's damn thing's perfect. He said, well, let's make one more perfect, because I've, he said, I've made about a half a dozen of these things, and he says, I've come up with a lot of tricks with a double cutaway. Mine was a cutaway, but the way this one is, it's just much more, I see what he's talking about. He says, tell me about how you'd like it. I said, well, steel string, and I said, I want the back side to be braced. If I want to put barbed wire on it, I can put barbed wire. I said, I want it braced so I can put another steel string with a different tuning or baritone if I want to do that. Sure. He said, okay, so this has interchangeable nuts. Wow. The Tommy Emanuel says, yeah, so do I, mate. <laughs> but <laughs> he popped this thing out and put in the one for the baritone uh -huh. or a steel string. He's got, a, I don't know, there's, I don't know how many he's got in that case. But um, I said, I want that. And I said, I'd, I'd like to get some kind of way to get the, the pickups. it will be different. The, the original had bags, ribbon pickups in it. And that took more time to make the pickups than it did to make the guitar. Because huh. Lloyd sent me the pickups and, and uh, 
Greg Crockman over here at Classic Axe put them in for me. And God, it sounded great. Man, a big crowd came over to Greg's place to see this guitar. But the thing was, if, if I change the tone here, it changed the tone of the other side. Oh, sure. And it ran the batteries down in about 30 minutes. Wow. I said, I can't get a full set out of the batteries. Though it shouldn't have two batteries, one for each pickup, because it's two separate systems. Lloyd says, pull the pickups out and send them to me. So we did that. He had it for a while, I don't know, a month or so, and then Greg called me and says, come on, we'll put these new pickups in your guitar. Put it in, and then it didn't run the battery down, had two separate batteries, but that's when you change the tone or the volume, it changed the other side. It's like, God, this can't work. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to make an isolator for that, too. Pull the, bat uh, the pickups out, send them back out to him. And I did that as well, and finally a month or so went by and sent it back, and it was perfect ever since. So with Dell, I said, I'm kind of getting into RMC pickups because I was using the Godan Multi-Act with the RMC pickup and using synth with it. So I said, um, I want this new one to have RMC pickups. So Richard McClish, do you know him? No. Well, he's at RMC, Richard McClish, RMC. Oh, there we go. And he's one of these real characters. He gets telling you, I said, I want to get a big bottom and I want to have this. Well, you see Tom and his eyes start rolling back and then all you see is whites of eyes and he's going into, <laughs> Uh, re revolving of the strings against the impedance of what we'll have. I just, that's what I want. You just ask what I want. That's what I want to do. You know what you should put inside of talking about your new duelette? You're wanting a synth to be able to hit the synth from either side? Yeah. Okay, you know what you should do is we should put mercury switches inside of it. So he had like 12 or, I don't know how many mercury switches he had in it. Now explain what, what a mercury switch. Mercury switch is, well, I don't know what they use them in, but like if, if I have a, something electronic here, it's got mercury in it. Yeah. And it sits down at the bottom because it's heavy and it makes it contact. So now you've got a contact and when you, like with the guitar, this, this side's on. Yeah. Turn it over. Mercury flows the Mercury other side. Mercury falls to the bottom. And wow. This side's on, this side isn't. And it's immediate like that. God, that's amazing. It happens. So his pickups finally went out, like I've had him go out on a couple of guitars. But there's a, a guy named Ben, a young guy in, in Louisville that is hooked up with Paul McGill. I don't know if you know Paul McGill or not. He made those great resonator guitars and the Super Chet or the Super, Super McGill or whatever just a great guitar maker and I was telling him the problems I had we everybody tried to fix that RMC even McClish he said I don't know what I did so I, I can't fix it I'm not a, a repair man anyway but you made the pickups can't you fix it so this guitar has been off the grid for maybe six seven years wow everybody tried everybody got frustrated and said you know I don't know what the guy did so McGill called me up, says, I have a new company called Go Audio. And he says, ours is like, like McClish taken to the next step up with better, um, uh, what do you call these, transformers? Trans yeah, Pizer or whatever. Trans whatever yeah. the hell. I play them, I don't make them. Yeah, yeah. Um, Some nerd in the comments will put it that will oh, no, yeah. they'll write they're typing so it out right now. He says, "Let me have that duelette, and I'll put one of my systems." I don't know. I want the just Tom. How long have you known me? Okay, I mean he he is brilliant, and he didn't roll his eyes back in his head either. So I gave <laughs> him the guitar. He had it a couple of years. He finally says, "Come over and play this guitar." And that's what's in it now. And there, he's just now getting them on the market. Wow. I've had, I've had these pickups probably a year or so, and they keep tweaking little things. Each string I can change. It's, of course, you got to pull this up, 
and with a little tool, each you can change the volume of each string individually. Oh wow! And the EQ of each string individually. Like if you want really brassy top, you can do that, or you want whatever. But so is that now your pickup of choice? Are you using it in all acoustics, or, or? Well, I'm using it in uh, two of them, two acoustics, and and this. So that'd be three all together. Yeah, that sounds great, man. Yeah, it, and it, as you can see, the thing is. Yeah, play that just a little bit more if you don't mind. I just want uh, to hear. What did I play it before? See, here. Uh, wait a minute. Let's see, isn't that funny? Somebody says play, play <laughs> guitar all my life. What can I play here? <laughs> that is. like you used to hear on like the, that first ovation I had. It was loud and thumpy, but it quacked right there in the middle. Uh -huh. I didn't care anything about a quack in the middle. This one doesn't have it, and it sounds really... God, that sounds... very amazing. acoustic if you play it with, you know, I'm using the pick, but... Sounds but great. But then the other side, Mercury switches in. This side you can hit the, all the rolling synth stuff with. Yeah. So I got that down, laying on my leg. Drop D tuners on it. Yeah, those banjo tuners, that's great. Yeah. Wow. So, um, well, that's that's amazing, and it's it's such a cool story because, well, your father Merle Travis was was he was a knob nut too. Yeah, you know? and he was and he was designing guitars all. I mean, he a huge designer, and it's interesting that you two share that same. I guess there's just a genetic thing. I think so because I when I was a kid, I thought I wanted to play piano and keyboards. That's what I I really wanted to do that. And then as I saw synth come in and all that, God, I don't play piano. But I had this gene that says, you're not going to play any piano. Yeah. And then I had all this royalty of guitar players around me. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, because you grew up, what were you saying around, like, okay, Thumbs Carlisle. And, Thumbs and Carlisle, Roy Lanham, Speedy West, uh, Jimmy Bryant. I used to get so close watching Jimmy's right hand because he was so fast. Yeah. He said, Tommy, back up. I'm going to hit your nose. <laughs> I'm sorry. He said, you can see it from back there. Yeah. He just worried about Right. He it. I just never saw anybody articulate, go through the strings the way he did with that thing. Joe Mapus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Joe played anything. If it had a string on it, Joe was going to play it. God. And play the fire out of it, too, you know? Yeah. You didn't so, have a choice. You had to be a great guitar player. <laughs> you didn't. So you I always had it. guitars around me, so I, I, I started playing, but it was the easy thing for me to do is keep my thumb going. That's where everybody had trouble right. doing that. This thing go all day long. Doesn't care. Right. And then I, I had to I didn't know where to put my hands though. <laughs> so there was a bass player with a group at the time that was really popular. Uh, I think they were popular in the late forties. I was born in forty eight. I'm old <laughs> and getting older. <laughs> and Gil was played bass with the Hoosier Hot Shots, and he came over one time and said, "Do you know any chords?" No. Let me show you. And he showed me three or four chords, and I got those immediately. And um, 
then I could uh, play my Merle Travis records, my Chet Atkins records. Yeah. And I get them in my head, and I could be at school in history class, for instance. I could hear what they're doing, and and I'm actually hunting and searching in my brain for where, where is that going to go? I could tell it went somewhere up here. Yeah. And then I found out, well, if you're going to go to A, you're playing there, but you're not a uh, seventh, but you can also do it here. You got to get that note or this. Oh, well, you can play the same chord different. Then I started learning that. And um, I wound up in Vegas with the Hank Penny Show. Hank had Roy Clark was with him, and Roy got a chance to open for Andy Griffith in the main showroom. So Hank says, time to move up, Roy. You're done. <laughs> he, Roy didn't want to leave the guys. Curly Chalker. Oh, yeah. You know, this great steel player. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, no, I don't want to leave the guys. Said, okay, Hank said, then you're fired. How's that? <laughs> so then Roy became Roy Clark, uh, yeah. as we all knew him. <laughs> and then a couple of years after that, Hank says, I'm going to go back into Vegas. And he went to my school and talked to the principal and my folks. See, I have a father and a dad, my father being Merle Travis, but my dad, Bud Bresch, who is a cameraman for the movie studios. That's where That's I get you... my love for cameras. God, there, there were go. always cameras everywhere, huh. and I could make money once I learned how to uh, load 120 film into those tanks and process it. <laughs> That's the most boring part of photography. And I could learn how to do that. My old man would pay me so much a roll, and make money, and he had this big, what they call a Peco dryer, because he did a lot of eight by tens. So all you do is lay the eight by tens, I think it was two or three across, and just go through this big drum and come out the top, put them over here. I got a quarter of print. So it was about 75 cents every time I put these three prints in it, sucking them in the next three, and it just went on like that. So I'm a kid making all kinds of money and uh, getting my love for guitars and for cameras and all that at the same time. Yeah. And having a movie ranch, which I wish I had now, the knowledge I have Boy. about. And weren't you a stuntman at one point? Were you I was Hollywood's youngest stuntman. <laughs> but. People look at me and think, oh my God, you did that thing like Fast and the Furious? No, they didn't do stuff like that. And I was a kid. I do small small things. My biggest claim to fame, I think, I fell off of a horse for Johnny Crawford and the Rifleman. Oh, that's great. That's great. So, I mean, I don't even know if Johnny, well, I don't know if Johnny even remembers that. I should ask him sometime, but he was, there was a rattlesnake that they shot somewhere else sometime. <laughs> Crawling across, and Johnny's out riding in the like the the range, and and back to the rattlesnake. And then you see a horse coming in the <laughs> rattlesnake. Then you see the rattlesnake coil up, and those rattles take off. Then the horse comes up, and Johnny falls off. That was me. It fell like off. Brush fall off a horse. Fall, fall off the yeah. horse onto a, a great big mattress. They have like a double mat, a double yeah. uh, size mattress all covered in dirt, came off on that, and then Johnny would fall down and hit his head on the foam rock. <laughs> and then they cut back to the footage they had of the snake coming up towards them, they go to commercial. Uh, and right. I guess Dad comes just in time to go, doo, 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 doo. <laughs> shoot the thing about 50 times with his Winchester. Yeah. That's and funny. so that's the most I ever did. But what I like to do, and I, I never could do it in any kind of a movie, but is go through the saloon windows. That's all uh, it's like glass, or it's, it's glass, but it's sugar and water. And they so, mix it and they, they put it up and you can see yeah. through it. It's like those breakaway bottles. They oh, hit sure. you across the head and it's no more than doing that to you. Yeah. You wouldn't feel. I mean, it's, it's nothing to it. <laughs> it's sugar water, but it breaks and you put the sound effects in. Sure. And it's terrible. I wanted to go. They're going to shoot a scene. They said, we're going to be shooting in the saloon, have a fight in there. Oh, can I go through the, when the fight breaks out, can I go through the glass? Because I was too young. You know, I started that stuff when I was like 12 or 13. And uh, they wouldn't insure me to do that. I said, nothing to it. Well, know? I've been thrown out of plenty of bars. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but they wouldn't let me do that, so that's the, the extent of my stunt work. However, at this big movie ranch where they shot all 
so many, 90% of the Westerns, a place called Corganville. Yeah. And that's where Fort Apache was built, and the, and the uh, uh, Robin Hood Lake was a quarter of a mile up one of those. There's 2,200 acres a lot there. Yeah. Big lake, man-made lake with a big waterfall, and it had a camera room down in it with lights. So I, they let me down in the camera room whenever you shoot a guy, a stuntman come in and wrestle with the alligator or whatever it's supposed to be. There's this big double glass like in a recording studio, but it, and they had lights that would light up out there and they'd shoot that stuff and I'd watch them do all that. Wow. So Chris, you really are the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't drink beer. I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're a wine guy. I'm hey, a wino. Hey, let's talk about this guy over here. Now I've got, there's two holes back here to plug into. And if I let somebody else plug in, they'll always go for this. Yeah. And that's a stereo pick up the world pickup. Huh. That's a couple of pieces of tape inside here. And it's, you record with it, it's just incredible. Makes a big hole in the middle and it just swarms around the center. And I keep telling, I say, you should be marketing this to the, us people with project studios at home that don't have floating rooms. It's hard to mic an acoustic guitar. You hear the people mowing the yards and the traffic going by. Oh, no, try it on the stage because, it, no, it won't work on the stage. Any kind of volume and it takes off, you know. Yeah. So, now what pickup do you have in this guitar? This pickup is also a Go Audio. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. Now this, okay, this, for you watching, this is probably a very familiar guitar. It's, it's I mean, a lot well, like the Merle Travis. this is taken off of Travis's original Martin D28, 38, yeah. 1938 D28, with a Bigsby neck, and this is a neck that he, uh, he designed he, that, right? He, I mean, yeah. Well, he drew it out on the back of a Dupar's uh, placemat. I think it was Dupar's. They got a book coming out on Travis. Oh, it's really? Been well researched, well researched by Deke Dickerson for. He's been researching it for years, and he's got so much stuff that I can't wait for it to come out. Yeah. Supposed to come out this year. Well, I mean, amazing innovation because I mean, I th the word is, and you can verify this, but Travis is the guy that came up with the idea of of three. Or six tuners on one side. Well, so yeah, but you know, you can look at, in the Martin Museum, see one made in 18 something that has all, oh, all really? the, it's not shaped like this, but it had all the huh. Travis's thing. And this doesn't say Bigsby on it, it says Bresh. Yeah, that's great. This guitar was made by Harvey Leach, H.G. Leach. And he uh, came here to Nashville, which he, he seldom does. He lives in Grass Valley, California. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Grass and down, man. <laughs> yeah, my, my kind of place. Mine too. <laughs> they make this uh, Grass City, USA sooner or later. Get rid of the music stuff. <laughs> but Harvey was at the house and I would play that. There was nothing like that Martin with the, the Bigsby neck. Yeah. But it was so cracked and, and the, the top went like this. And Travis oh. says, if anybody ever says they'll fix the top and, and make a new top, don't let them. Just say, no, it's fine. And uh, I said, oh, okay. He says, it, that would ruin this guitar because it, it's just, it's old and that's why it's got its sound. It's uh, like 60 years old at the time. And so Harvey said, well, I can make you one that sounds and feels like it. I said, oh, can you? Yeah. He's brilliant with inlay and with wood and all of this. I said, okay, well, he was staying at my house. So we'd be watching HBO and he'd sit there with a yellow pad and a micrometer and he'd do it like half an inch at a time, write down all these coordinates and did that all the way up the neck and all these different little things he's writing down. And he would do this over a course of three or four days while we were at home at night and hanging out and so I don't know how many months maybe six months later he says I'm coming to Nashville I got your guitar I want you to play it oh okay so we pulled it out and I said wow Brazilian rose look at that Brazilian wow mm, baby because yeah. uh yeah just beautiful and it didn't have a pickup in it it was just uh Brazilian rosewood and I so I played it. And what's what's the top? 
The top is what, when I play like. Wow, that sounds like Travis's acoustically. Yeah. How the hell did you do that? You got that anironic spruce that's just been thrown up on, whiskey spilled on it, and <laughs> everything you can think of, left in the car for a week in, in the sun and in the snow and everything. And he said, oh, you'll never hear this top change. This is a piece of thousand-year-old California redwood. Wow. He says, you, you won't live long enough to hear it change at all. Wow. And it's got that song. It's a little quieter, like Travis's, that that anironic spruce when it was, and the action is so low on this. Yeah, you keep your action low on all, yeah, your, all your guitars. Yeah. I think it's like 364ths off the floor. Wow. Floor. I think Ed Beaver told me it's 364th. I could be wrong, but I think it's that. Maybe it's 464th. No, that would translate something else. 364th. Yeah. yeah, I like it down because it's like an electric. Yeah. And it's thin too. Look at how thin it is. Oh, yeah. Travis's. So is that what the I mean what the what Travis is was it that thin? Yeah. So he this copied is, it. Yeah, he did it this deal. Like I would go, I went and got Travis's out of the case. I play this, my eyes closed, play it, and I get Travis's play it. Damn man, you're really wow good at this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I like the. So this one we called the the spirit. I said, uh, he said I'm gonna make. It. I said, well, we got to make it so. It would be what Travis would order if he was going to try to get a new guitar. That's yeah. what I'd like it to be. He says, okay, like, what would that be? I said, well, inlay down the sides of the neck and all that and around the, the body, you know, I mean, dolled up. Yeah. If Travis had his way, he'd have Merle Travis and lights going down. <laughs> Merle Travis, eat here, sleep here, <laughs> yeah. Merle Travis. Yeah, yeah, he understood branding. He. Uh, I said to Travis one time, that big Super 400 Gibson he had, I said, I said, Merle Travis down the neck, can't miss it. Why do you have that? He says, well, because he says, you get up there and play for 45 minutes or an hour and nobody has the slightest idea who you are. At least I thought they read that long enough. But he says, that got put to rest one night I was playing and I was up there an hour and this woman right down in the front came up get my autograph after the show, and she says, can I ask you a question? Well, most certainly, young lady, what would you like to know? Is Mary Travers your daughter? <laughs> so he said, I became a Travers. Yeah, so they don't, they don't know, they don't get it. Yeah. So I would have it in neon. <laughs> so Harvey and I had a laugh about that, but this one's all dolled up. I said, you gotta make me one out of the cheapest wood you can find. So I can see how that feels and sounds. So it was three, four months later, and he sent this guitar. It's Vietnam rosewood or Vietnam uh, spruce on the top, or Vietnam rosewood, I guess is what it was, and some cheap spruce. I can't even tell you now because I don't remember. But it felt the same, and it sounded good. It was really a hog too. Huh. That one was loud because huh. of that big spruce top on it. So, uh, that's the, great. I'll get into the shape of this neck and why here in a minute. Or oh so. yeah, yeah. Actually, that's a good that's a good segue. Before we put away this acoustic, can you talk about this thumper you're using? Um, this stumper of mine. This is a, a porch board. I think the cord came out. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I had a great big long thing like this, and this big, and it was all wood, and you stomp that. And boy, I love that. I I met the lady and the, the man that made it. The original, they had it. I went to some show they had over the Municipal Auditorium, and they were right on the entryway there. Some guy was playing. Uh, <laughs> I heard. I said, "What is that thing?" She said, "Oh, we call that the porch board bass." I said, "Can I play that?" Yeah, I said, let me show you something. I went. Yeah. I said, wow, that's neat. But it wouldn't fit in any suitcase. 
And it wouldn't go in a gig bag. It was just a big pain in the butt. And uh, she passed on here a few years ago, and she was going to send me. She said, I got a little one that I'm making now. She says, it's just, it's really small, and it'd be perfect for what you're wanting. I said, oh, really? And she says, I'll get you one. My son's going to take over the company. He'll be down in the Chet thing, introduce him around. Well, he never showed up. Kind of flaky. No offense, but kind of flaky. <laughs> sure. And uh, they didn't want to sell me one. I said, no, I, I kind of put you, help put you guys on the map. I, I don't want to buy one. Well, we're back ordered, and I can't even make you one. Blah, 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 blah. So uh, there's a guy here in town that does the rock and review named uh, Eric. Doll. Yeah, I, I know, you know Eric. Eric. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Makes damn good wine. Too. He makes damn good wine, yes, and he he's got. So anyway, he's got I had Martin, like a, I had my big ass porch board over at his yeah. house, and he says, "You play with that thing?" I yeah, it's pain in the butt and all that. And uh, I said, "They make a little one like this." I said, "I like to get my hands on it, but I said I can't, I can't get it." So, whatever, I'll put up with this thing. I just won't fly with it. I hate not having it. And so uh, I played a couple songs in his backyard for the people who were there. And he comes down and he says, here, what is that? And it was this one. He said, I got two of these. Huh. I want you to have one. And he brought me a, a Fox News bag. He said, here's a gig <laughs> bag. We'll put it in there, which is that one right there, Fox News. <laughs> yeah, that's and great. I said, wow, that thing is cool. And uh, I was playing a, a thing with Miles and, and Tim Thompson. Have you met Miles and Tim? Uh, no, well, no. Miles is the dad, Tim's the kid, and he plays plays a hell out of a mandol uh, mandolin and violin and all mm -hmm. that. And Tim is a monster guitarist, and they play everything just in perfection. Or Tim will jump Miles' butt. So Miles <laughs> has grown up knowing it's got to be perfect. Yeah. And it is, and it's great. If you ever get a chance to see Tim and Miles, go see him. And uh, he wrote an arrangement for a song that I wrote called Sidewalks of Bordeaux. He wrote the arrangement for strings and the two of them along with me. So we're going to play it at the Chet Atkins Appreciation Society. I said, great. And... Uh, so I go, get up there to, to do a sound check. Tim says, where's your amp? I said, I don't use an amp. I just go direct. Usually use an Apex or an acoustic exciter. Yeah. You know, no, you got to have an amp so we can we can do a blend, you know. Uh, uh, just go in one of those rooms. They're all selling stuff. So I went in. I said, you guys have an amp I can use? And uh, he says, yeah. He said, we've got uh, this. No, no. you got to... A-E-I, here, I said, I don't like A-E-I's. And he's a little fishman. I said, well, I played with fishman before. Give me that, because I'm I, it's familiarity thing. I blew up to A-E-I's. So he gave us a little fishman, and I went and plugged it in, got a sound that I liked on the stage, and anywhere I went on the stage, I sound the same, because it's coming out of this. Yeah. Then I got my little boxer, and I plugged it in the mic input, get the the blend I want for the house. And I said, well, I kind of like this. I went to the guy, I said, I don't want to give this back to you. How much do you want for it? Well, it's used. I can let you have it for so much. Great. So I bought it, and I've it's been in the car ever since. So it's so always that's in your... the trunk of the car. It's getting beat to hell. But that's uh, another thing. You beat it to hell. doesn't have a case. Right. Rolls around. I can hear when I turn, I can hear it rolling. <laughs> it doesn't matter. God, yep. that, that's amazing. So that, so that little Fishman Mini and... And then the XLR out into the big system. And that Stomper. And so when you, when you, um, when you tour, you usually just carry the double neck, that, and, uh, and uh, the Stomper in your amp? Well, if, unless I'm flying. Otherwise, yeah. then I'll just I'll grab the, my old Apex out and, and just yeah. the... Two neck. Though. God, it sounds great. I yeah. miss that when I play and don't have this. I miss that thump on the bottom, especially on singing things like, like. Ugh. Whatever. 
Yeah. I miss that bottom when you get subs and all that. And get oh, out. yeah. If there's a good sound guy, I'll, get, I'll let him have the... Do you, Otherwise, I don't let the sound guy mess. He gets what I give him. Yeah. Do you, do you use the stomper when you go for when you play electric as well? Yeah. I don't play electric much. Well, but when I do, yeah. We got to get into that guy over there. Let's let's let's. This, God, this guitar is is so great. I'll tell you a quick Travis thing. I was watching with his old Martin, and he always had a puffing on a cigarette. That's why he wrote "Smoke, Smoke, Smoke" that cigarette. Yeah, yeah, right. Puffing on that cigarette, and he'd be somewhere and uh, look around, take another puff, and he'd go like that, and bring it back up and be talking. I see him do that two or three times while he's. Pop that ash, go right in the hole of his guitar. And afterwards, I said, "Do you do that all the time? Is this thing like full of ashes?" <laughs> he had to shake it and find me an ash. And I shook the hell out. No ashes came up. Ash is a product of wood, and it it goes into the pores of the wood, and the, it, the guitar seems to like it. If I have an ashtray, I'll use that. But I'm not going to go onto somebody's floor when I could simply just. Put it in there, you know. Oh, that is great. I'll tell you another great thing Travis said one time. He called me up one day. He said, "Hey, Mott." He always called me Mott. That's Tom backwards. Hey, Mott. He did a lot of he did a lot of things backwards. Uh, always write the end of the song first. He huh. said, "I learned that. Then you know where you're going as a songwriter." Oh. He says, "Otherwise, you can write a good song by going forward. But if you know where you're going, you can really." take people down those wow. back alleys and everything that huh. you know as a writer where you're going. They don't. See, that's how you always write your ending first. That's in a story, an essay, a book, uh, anything you write, write the ending first. Oh, if you're writing something to shoot in your movie, write the ending first so you know where you're going. And then fill in all the rest of it oh. knowing where you're going. Uh, okay. That's genius. Well, he says, hey, let's go get us a steak, a T-bone steak. I said, all right. Pick me up such and such time. So I picked him up. And we went to this restaurant, and the waitress comes up, kind of a cute little gal. Can I get you gentlemen a drink? And go ahead, Ma, get a stiff one. And I said, yeah, I'm going to have some tequila and grapefruit juice. He goes, woo, tequila and grapefruit juice. That's pretty good for a young guy. I guess. <laughs> Let me have something a little stronger. I've been in it longer than he has. She says, yes, sir, what would you like? I'd like a big glass of water, if you please. She says, oh, I don't think water is stronger than tequila and grapefruit. His eyes went black like a shark, and he looked at her and said, young lady, water is the toughest, uh, the strongest element known to man because it cannot be weakened, and I would like a glass of it. I thought, whoa. She looked at me like panic. <laughs> I said, I never thought of that. Well, what do you young people think about? But did you ever think of that? No. No, I didn't either, but it's true. Yeah. How do you weaken water? You can't. Yeah. Strongest substance known to man because it cannot be weakened. Well, I guess that there's something to that. So we had our steak, and that's what I learned that night. But Travis was always, always toying and tinkering around. And back when he was doing it in the... Like in the the forties, you know, the, there was a lot of stuff you could experiment with. Like Les Paul was a friend of his, and and he called him uh, rhubarb red. That's all. He would never call him Les Paul. His old rhubarb is such and such, such and such. And Les and I were talking one night while he was eating his salmon backstage and spilling the rice, spitting the rice out all over his turtleneck. Oh, he's got a kick out of that. He didn't give it any. He said, I'm not a goddamn fashion show up here. People come in here and he couldn't play too much, but when he'd hit something, 
and that echo is like, oh my God, your hair would stand right. up. Right. But um, Les says, your old man would never take credit for his brilliance. He said, I take everybody's credit. <laughs> he says, you know, and uh, he says, that, and then Les would start telling you who wanted his stuff over anybody else's stuff yeah. and whatever. But Travis, they they were both making a solid body guitar at the same time. Right. Travis drew this thing out to Paul Bigsby, who was a motorcycle racer, yeah. and he made those great solid Bigsby steel guitars. Travis said he wanted, he said to Paul, can you make me a regular guitar like you make it out of that curly maple and all that sort of thing? Paul said, yeah, I can do any damn thing, real loud sort of character. I never got to meet Paul. Travis said, real loud, I can do any goddamn thing you want, you know? And so Travis says, I drew out this guitar on a back of a placemat we had. I think he said it was Dupar's restaurant. I could be wrong. It doesn't make any difference. It was the back of one of those paper placemats. And Travis was a good artist. He drew cartoons all the time. Huh. And uh, just, he was brilliant at doing that. I draw a stick man, people say, well, what is that? Uh, that's the guy, here, I'll put a nose on <laughs> Oh, okay. He's going that way? No, he's going over here. What's the difference? Well, the nose should be on this side. I'm not trying to draw, I'm trying to show you something. So, um, he says, I want it to look like a fiddle, except be a guitar. He says, I, I make a headstock that goes straight down like this and it'll look like a fiddle. This originally went up like a fiddle. Oh, the scroll And went you'll up. see on this guitar I'm about to bring up. Let's bring it up now yeah, so let's I can do it. tell this. Yeah, okay. Let me grab this thing. Well, here. You John, why don't we hand this guy to you? Throw this somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. Thanks, John. Keep it offset. Yeah. Give me this. This. Oh, God, that's so cool. This is how the, the, origi the original is in the Hall Country Music Hall of Fame. I've seen it there. Yeah, yeah. it's in the Country Music so There's Merle Travis down here. And a little side, the, my mind takes off. Merle Travis, he says, do you ever notice when I sign my name, I sign Mule Train and nobody would know the difference? <laughs> I said, really? Oh, yeah. The way he made his E and R. Oh, it, really? And Travis, at the end, could look like an I-N. He says, uh, next person comes up and asks for an autograph, I'll write Mule Train. I said, oh, okay. And some guy comes up and says, Mr. Travis, can I get your autograph? He says, yeah. And he takes his thing, writes it down. He says, what's your name? John, John, keep picking. Da, da, da. Look at what, what watch it. <laughs> Merle. <laughs> How many people have you seen do that when you ask for their autograph? Yes. Merle <laughs> and <laughs> Travis, there you go, uh, fellow. Thank you, sir. You pick, yeah, uh, good. Cause I put keep picking. I didn't even ask. <laughs> well, look at that wood. That wood is fabulous. Yeah, that's great. This guitar is made. Was made. This is not an original. It's a replica of the original, made with original parts. This was made by Eric Galetta out there in Hemet, California. Well, he nailed it. Yeah, he did. Now, see, it's got like the fiddle bridge. Yeah. And now, what year? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. What? What year? So he was designing this about the same. Is this late forties? Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe it is. Yeah, isn't that wild? And this is the exact measurements. The exact, these screws came out of R. C. Allen's box, and these pickups. He had all the stuff that he got from Bigsby. These are all original parts. These pots, I had to have the pots. And the guy said, hey, come on, brush. I said, this one's noisy. He says it's 60 some years old. Yeah. Give it a break. It's a real deal. You'll be noisy when you're 60 some yeah. years old, too. But uh, he made this guitar. Hey, let's, can we uh, plug it in? Well, it doesn't sound right through any uh, of these amps. And oh, it's okay. got my, I got. Well, we'll get the other one. We'll, we'll hear the other one. I got. It's loud, right? It's strange. <laughs> I don't play much rock and roll. <laughs> but you can see if this went up, and the original, RC had a, 
a picture of the original in the template also, how it went up. And Travis said, oh, this thing ain't going to work. You're going to have to make a neck. This part goes down because you hit your hit your knuckle every time you try to tune the E string. That would drive me crazy. Yeah. So they went down with it. That's why it went down. And I said, why the six tuning pegs the machine has all in a row? I'm glad you asked that. You probably wanted some brilliant answer, don't you? I said, yeah, give me a brilliant answer. Put a guitar up like this on your on your lap and change the strings. A regular guitar. You got three here that go on easy, and then you got to contort yourself around to try to put the other three. Right. I said it'd be easier if they were all in line and the strings would go straight to the tuning pegs that way. Sure. Like in my drawing there. See? Yeah. He said that's all you need to do. He says that's the brilliance behind it. And he says when <clears throat> Bigsby brought the thing into me. Uh, he was playing somewhere down in, in Southern California, and one of his supporters, biggest fans, was Leo Fender. Leo made amplifiers. That's all he made. And he said, I played this on that first set, finished singing my song and playing, you know. Nobody had ever seen nothing like this solid body. And he and Les Paul were getting arguments that Les says, well, I think my solid body is before yours. He says, yours ain't a solid body. Yours is a log that you have to put on acoustic sides to play it or you can't play it. You can shape mine like the state of Texas if you want to. It doesn't care. It, uh, you can't play yours. Huh. You have to put the sides and it becomes a hollow body electric and induces feedback. Uh, he said, Leslie, you can't, can't hear yours. That's why Leo makes amplifiers. You just plug it into an amplifier Make it as loud as you want to tune it up. Uh, yeah. So that the, that's how the two of them reacted to each other. Ah, how and, cool. And so uh, Travis finishes set and he says, Leo went crazy over this guitar. He looked at it, oh God, that's just wood. And then you make it. When the new wears off of this, Trav, can I borrow it for a couple of weeks? I want to try to make a guitar like it. Won't be as fancy, but it'll be like it. I'd like to try to do that. I like the way that sounds. It just sustains forever. Like he says, never heard a guitar do that. So he said, "Well, I, I wasn't that crazy about it. To be honest with you, I said, here, take it with you tonight." And he had it about three weeks and comes in with carrying two cases, gives me this one, and and uh, he says, "I, I here, here's my one I made. I call it a broadcaster." He opens it up. He said, it was a dull looking thing. And he said, I, I went with the same sort of, it's not fancy like yours, it just kind of nubs around, but he says, uh, it does the same thing. He said, would you just do me a favor and play it on one song up there so I can hear it in the audience? I'll play the whole set with it. How would you like that? I'd love to have a picture of that. Yeah, but, but no I kidding. don't. He said, I played it the whole set and Leo is down there. That chest was out. He was so proud of that guitar. And he said, I never said this to Leo because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't like the way that broadcaster thing sounded. It was it was a, a tinny, just tinny sounding. It, that's what I didn't like about this, uh, the Bigsby. It was tinny, and I think that broadcaster was even tinnier than this Bigsby. Tinny being to have that twang sure. you know, that made yeah. that in the telly famous. Right. Travis didn't want nothing to do that. He wanted that big bottom which was supposed to be like a bass and yeah. playing with him. He couldn't get that out of that yeah. out of that telly. I had a, a telly one time. I forward pick up and I set it a certain way and I got I got a good sound out oh, of Oh Jimmy Bryant sounded amazing. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy yeah. had it. I mean but not Travis's style. He said you can't play it like that. Well which actually that's a good segue to get into to this big beast over here. Yeah. But look at these strap knobs. Oh yeah, these are originals. Like the strap hooks around it, like one of those things that you right. push down and put around a gate to yeah. put the chain across. Push down the thing and you click. It's brilliant. Uh, every part in it is original, and Eric can make them. Yeah, that makes it perfect, and uh, it's exactly like the the original. This was made off of number one. Travis's was the original number one was the first one that that 
Paul made after making Travis. Yeah. And this, uh, R.C. Allen had number one, and R.C. and Eric were like this, like Eric, he was a mentor, R.C. was a mentor. Huh. He made so many guitars and stuff over the years, answered any kind of question, and was there for it all as well. Right. So he, he made sure that Eric had all, everything to make. Everything about this is just like an original, and it feels, I've had people that had the big, how does this feel compared, to, oh man, he's dead ass on. Yeah. But now, I've got, I put these little tins on here and stuff, can't do any finger picking much. Well, you can, it's really funky and. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not what I, I strung it up like this. This was for an uh, armrest. And uh, Eric yeah. Galletta. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, that, and, it's, and so after Bigsby designed that, is that when he had, is that when Travis had the Bigsby neck put on the Martin? Yeah, he, he liked the neck, but he didn't like the guitar. He was too yeah. tinny. <laughs> and so he, he said to Paul, he says, can you put a neck, because he, he says, Martin's the greatest guitar in the world, but it's got the worst neck on it of any guitar made. Yeah. According to Travis, for his style, being able sure. to do all these yeah. wild chords and everything. So, uh, Big, I do any goddamn thing you want, you know. Big, he's loud like this, and made him a neck and put it on that Martin. That's the one that was in from here to eternity. Oh, and, that's great. And uh, he played it for years. It, it was just uh, such an incredible guitar. And then Martin got a hold of me and said, "We want to make a Merle Travis model." I said, well, "It's got to be maple neck." Oh no, maple necks. Uh, you can't put that on an acoustic. I said, "What?" There's one right here that, that makes the lyre out. Oh, you, yeah. you put it on there, but they don't sound good. Look, this makes you a liar again. So finally, they it was going to be a deal breaker. They want to put a rosewood neck. They said, we're going to use the same headstock and everything, but we'll put Martin in this font. Then I got a call one day from Dick Boak there at Martin. He says, hey, uh, Chris Martin wanted me to call you because he says he's having dinner with uh, Fred Gretsch tomorrow night. Wanted to know if you wanted to give up the royalty on one of your guitars. I said, for what? Well, he's going to ask Fred if he can use the Bigsby name so they can have it look just like a... Oh, thing. great. And so Fred Gretsch says, I don't play guitars. Just give me one of the ones you turned down. I like to be able to put it on my wall. Yeah, use it up. Yeah. Enjoy it. We get a little plug for Bigsby out there and one for Travis, so I didn't even have to give up a royalty. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> and uh, the Travis model felt just like Travis's. It's got a, a inch and what is it, one and eleven thirteenths, I think. Feel how small well, this one's not as small as as, the, as your uh, other one. Yeah, that other one does feel smaller, but boy, that feels good though. That's a really comfortable neck. But you feel that, that uh, wherever that uh, another Martin the leech. Oh yeah, out. there it is. Hold feel on. that. That's exactly like Travis's. Yeah, you know what? Uh, and that's small. A lot of people don't like it, you know. But you know, Eric Dahl, who you mentioned, has one of these. Yeah, uh, the Martin. He got. Reissues. He didn't get the Travis model though. When yeah, it was all over. Yeah, that's great. See how small that is? Yeah. Because you can get all those those kind of cords. Yeah. And uh, Eric got the Martin with the uh, Bigsby neck, but it's wide. His neck is wide because yeah. they were going to make a second model, but then he didn't have to share royalties with me. So Fred and Chris got together, shooed the fresh man out of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's as it goes. Hey, you got to get into this thing now, too. Yeah, Since this one here. So uh, I've seen uh, videos online of you and your dad playing. And I think he had a, uh, had a Super 400. Yeah, Super, Super 400, 400 yeah. with that crazy, huge whammy bar on it. And well, uh, this is a D'Angelico. Yeah, okay. It's, let's, but let's it's hear not the story one on made this. by John D'Angelico. This is the new D'Angelico bunch, and they they wanted to make a guitar like Travis's Super 400. They said, for you to play when you do your Travis stuff out there, we'd like it to be a D'Angelico. Yeah. And we'll make it off of a New Yorker, because that's an 18 inch, like the, so this was originally a New Yorker. 
And I said, it's got to have like those original P90 pickups. I have another one that uh, was made by Aaron Cowles that has Gibson P90s and it no more sounds like a P90 than, than a freight train does. Really? And I called Seymour Duncan. I said, hey, do you have a P90? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, what do you want? The like a old one, or nine, like fifty-two or so. Yeah, yeah. My, get my dog-eared. I'll send you a couple dog-eared P90s. They're they're just like eighteen-year-old P90. They won't. Now you're used to Travis's. It was made in fifty-two or fifty-three, somewhere in there, fifty-four. And over the years, they they, sure. they lose some of their strength, just yeah. like you will. And these, but these are are muscled up young P90s. I said, do they sound the same? Same exact wrap, same exact everything. The wire, everything is the same. And boy, it is. This guitar is, uh, sounds just like Travis's and it's got this whammy yeah. knob that Travis came up with. Yeah, what is the story on that? He, he wanted, well, see, Gibson made that uh, Vibrola, and you shook it this way. Yeah. And it was good for about one shake, and then everything was out of tune. Yeah. Travis says, they're going about it wrong. He got his pad out, drew it. You got to take a string and go around a piece down here and buckle the string behind it. Now, the string comes over, and then this, this lever that comes out, push it up and down, and it'll loosen, tighten the strings up, and it'll sound like a steel guitar then. So he said to Paul Bigsby, can you can you make one of those for me? And he says, yeah. He says, uh, how are you going to get it to go back to the exact place it's supposed to go? Travis says, I told you how to do it. I ain't no mechanic like you are, <laughs> and I don't know how to make things. That's for you to figure out. And so I guess that stumped old uh, uh, Bigsby for for a while. And uh, Travis said he had a call one night and says, hey, I got this contraption of yours working if you want to come down tomorrow and try it out. And Travis said, I, I couldn't get up early enough <laughs> to get down, to, down here wherever. And we don't have, oh, we do have a mic oh, yeah. there. in tune. Oh, how, how did you do that? And that's how, I gotta turn this off, it's got a buzz. Um, I said, how did he get this, that, that to come to the exact spot? He said, and Travis told me, he said, well, you know, Paul's a, a motorcycle racer. And he said, that was driving him crazy about how to get it to come back. So he was laying in bed and he said, no, oh, Harley Davidson valve spring has got to come back in exact tolerance or you can blow that engine up in a Harley. So he got up that next morning, got him a Harley uh, spring, went in there, made a, made a mount so it would be on one side to hook it and weld it together, put that spring in there. I'll be there. <laughs> Travis, I think I got this thing working. I think Travis told me it was like almost 20 years they, they got the part from Harley Davidson, the spring. And really? then they got, then they, then the Japanese came in and they were able to get it made yeah. just like it by the Japanese and they started using that. But originally it was a Harley Davidson valve spring. God, isn't that great? That's the way those mines work, you know? Yeah. Today you have to digitize something to, then they'd print it out on a, 3D printer. Sure. Try that. No, nope, that doesn't work. God, that's just, I mean, what what an amazing part of history. I mean, just oh, God. so I, you know, innovative and, I mean, genius, man. It's the only way you can. And Harvey Leach did all the, the inlay, just like Travis's, the, the, the 
Same sort of font uh, that yeah, Harvey that's great. used. Well, there's this great Even this, this is a cowboy hat. I don't know if you oh, can yeah, see yeah. that. This is a, a cowboy hat, that black part where they have D'Angelico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's bigger on this because the D'Angelico has a bigger headstock yeah. than the uh, Gibson Super 400 did. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, that's... And that's, these strings are old enough to vote. <laughs> hey, so, so okay, and one quick detail. What... What strings do you use on your acoustics and your electrics? What do you usually I use? D I like Diodario. I yeah. tried everything. I like Diodario. And I like the ones they call the bluegrass Diodario. Uh, heavy bottom, light top, or light top, heavy bottom, or what? medium bottom. They call them bluegrass strings. Basically, they're like 55 to 12 or something like yeah. that. And what, what thumb picks do you use? The one I really like is this one. I love this thumb pick. It's a, a Golden Gate okay. thumb pick made out in San Francisco, obviously. There we go. But they make so damn many of these. Even this model comes with big, wide, long uh, tips. I can't get, I got like five of these. And I was so thrilled and I called and ordered a bunch and they had great big, I, said, I can't use this. <laughs> Do you have a model? Number? Oh no, they all come out different. Well, so I like these. I so you got five picks to last you. Yeah. yeah and let's see, Johnny Highland fell in love with the Fred Kelly pick, and he gave me one of those, and I've got one of those, and I'll use it. And then here's here's one I really like. What boy find the right? What's the name pick? of that? You see a name on that? Uh, no, I don't. But I like that because I like them to fit. I get the, boy, I, my thumb's going, and I don't want them turning around and yeah. stuff. And um, when I was playing the Godin, I would use these Fred Kelly. <laughs> I think he calls these speed picks. Yeah. I told Fred. I said, Fred, you should call these picks. Up yours, because <laughs> you're dealing with musicians, Fred, and he's very religious. All right, he just got red just right now. <laughs> blood went right to his face. He got red. Oh, oh, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I said, Yeah, but it's like that would mean something. Everybody'd have to get a bunch of up yours picks just so they can have them. Yeah, and they're thin, and I can't hold a flat pick because I I haven't my whole life. I've yeah. used thumb picks. Sure. And a flat pick will start turning, and then bang, there it goes. I won't yeah. get through a whole song with a flat pick. But I like to, and these, because the thin ones really give, sounds just like a flat pick. Huh. When I'm recording in the studio or something. I have one of those new ones that Highland likes. I've got Highland playing with a thumb pick now. Yeah. And no it's... longer plays with a flat pick. He just, the thing he's so blown away by is the fact that he, uh, he can do all of his licks, and he's got one more finger now. He can right get to play more. Yeah, that dude's amazing. Yeah, and I found this one on the floor while I was getting ready. That's another one of those good. Yeah. Um, San Francisco yeah, picks. Yeah, the Golden Gate. Golden Gate picks, and then here is an interesting pick. It has my signature on it. Nice. I got. Um, Oh, hold it if you're wanting to get a shot. I don't know if you even care about getting a shot of this, but I used to use all John Pierce strings when John was alive. And he sent me a letter one day, or he might have called, I don't remember. Besh, get a nice big piece of paper and, and sign your name with a Sharpie. Because he says, I'm going to do some ads and I want to have your name. So uh, all the guys use my string. Oh, well, okay. And I'll send you some strings. I got enough strings, John. So anyway, it was two, three months later, and here comes UPS with all these picks, grosses of picks. A note, when these are gone, there are no more, and there will be no more, and you can't get the material. I bought all the acetate I could find in the world to make John Pierce picks, and I, we took one day to retool, and I said, now, the last day on Friday, just run brush picks all day till we're out of this material. Really? You got these six gross or whatever, enjoy them, and don't 
use a, a cigarette lighter around them because they will take off like a sparkler. Yeah. The first thing I had to do is light one up. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. But they've got their own sound, huh. you know. But as you wear them and the heat from your finger gets on and the pick, they start getting loose. Really? Yeah. And Buster B. Jones tell me, just leave them alone, boss. Close them down like this, set it on, use another one. That one will go back tight. And then as you, as you play a set, you might have to go through a couple picks in the set. But I don't have my my green Johnny Highland uh, Fred Kelly pick. It's, but it's green and it stays on pretty good. Doesn't turn much. But Johnny says it didn't turn on all on me. And Johnny gave me this one. He said he was somewhere. And he said Did I put it on. I put this pick on. Ooh, brush will like that. Did you see how tight that is? Yeah, I, I have really fat thumbs. I can't get. Oh yeah, you got my thumbs. Yeah, I, it's yeah, freakishly yeah. large thumbs. <laughs> I can, yeah. <laughs> so this one still probably go around you because it's so flimsy. Watch it break, you'll feel bad. Yeah, no. That it's go around you. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, and it's got a sound, nothing like acetate. Yeah, and that's these, interesting that the body heat will make it. Yeah, it makes them loosen up. Yeah. I don't care how new it is. You play in a while, the yeah. body heat just starts. They start wanting to turn on you. Yeah. Can't have that. Yeah. So, well, Tom, I tell you, it, it is such a uh, honor to just hang with you and hear all these stories oh. and hear your plan, man. I mean, thank you. I'm glad to get this out of the closet. I got to put some new strings on it. I miss the sound of it. Oh yeah, and hey, for you people watching, there's this great video of uh, Brush with uh, with Travis, and you guys are both. Is with the Super 400, you're both playing at the same time. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. It is wild. That's from that old TV show in Canada. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Tom had a TV show. Uh, was it uh, Nashville Swing? Nashville Swing. It's we shot in, in Toronto, Toronto, Canada. <laughs> Great band. Boy, I wish I had that band. Oh yeah, yeah. Mike Pepe Francis guitar and Johnny Edwards. Not Johnny Edwards. I was thinking of Nokia, and then I started thinking of Johnny Highland. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's not important that you're not a band anymore. Yeah, a different chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great hey. fun. I'm glad you guys watched this. Yeah, appreciate it. Oh, I'm over on True Fire also. I've oh yeah, yeah. Check out his lessons there. Actually, there's a great thing on on working your thumb around. That uh, I just watched that about. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. It's good. Nothing to it. Well, for you, makes more, <laughs> no, it just makes to me it makes more sense. Yeah, it yeah, it totally does. Hey, well, why don't you play us a little something out? Oh God! <laughs> You're like, what do I play? <laughs> I got this. Here, give me that dual. That let's play oh, that. Yeah. Where's? Let's go out on that Here, one. Take okay. that. Take big that. Heavy thing. Give me this big heavy thing. Okay, good. Somebody said, I think your guitars are heavier than Les Paul's. I God. said, yep, I think you're right. Yeah, that thing is heavy. My lower back is not happy with doing these shows anymore. Oh, yeah, high mileage on that lower back. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, you got the mighty Fishman. Is there anything you'd like to hear? Uh, That's good. I'll play that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Is there anything? Uh, we were talking about Travis. Let me just play a, a Travis song on the dual app. Yeah. And we'll call it a day. <laughs> Make sure and subscribe if you like this. <laughs> punch the thumbs up. If you didn't like it, punch it twice. <laughs> Sure, go to it.
walking the bass. I used to do this part on the bass.